Hello and welcome to the Analytics Show, the podcast of business through the lines of data science. But together, we'll dive into learning and sharing where various industries are heading and how data and analytics is at the heart of shaping business growth and productivity. Let's spark different ways of thinking about data and analytics that is relevant to you and prepare your business for future disruption. I'm your host, Jason Tan. I'm delighted you could make it on this journey with us. Hey guys, to continue to get support tips, techniques, and tools and learn from the expert, hit that subscribe button wherever you are so we can keep in touch and continue our lifelong learning together. Hello, 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 Chris. Welcome to Analytics Show Podcast. So excited to have you here today to chat about some of the works that you guys are doing. Hey, Jason, lovely to meet you and thanks for the opportunity. Really looking forward to sharing a bit of Strong Room and myself and some of the work we're doing. Well, I've heard about Strong for, for so long and I've always been wanting to talk to you guys. So I'm so excited and thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to, to learn and share what you guys are doing with the rest of the world. Before I get on to some of the technical challenging questions that I am going to throw at you, I just want to ask you a few things that I have found when I was doing my research. I read that you work in a team to, to develop an AI-driven time system while you were still in uni. Crazy. Tell us more about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so I think that was during my third year of university and it was part of a what's called a capstone project that ran for the whole year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was super exciting. We got one of the projects, which was essentially to create a timetabling tool mm -hmm. um, to more effectively place students and classes within rooms. Yeah. Um, there had been some issues at the university I went to, which was Swinburne, where uh, you know, rooms would be double booked or they wouldn't be in an appropriate room with, say, computers and the like. Um, and so they were looking for some kind of solution to to address that. So um, that was a bit about the project, but we worked in a team of, I think, six people and used mm. some interesting technologies such as a graph-based uh, database. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we kind of mocked up the whole solution from design and development and then actually implemented it to to see how it would go speaking of Swedesman, i i think i almost went there for my uni i did get an offer from there but i ended up coming to uh, qt in, in Brisbane, so we could have been uh uni met although i am a little bit older <laughs> who knows <laughs> now i actually before i moved <laughs> you spoke about the capstone program and that was the entire year how was that experience of that you think that would have been so helpful for whatever things that you you are doing today yeah yeah exactly well i think it was both a benefit to you know my future work at strong room but also at the time when we were doing that capstone project we'd actually started max and myself my co-founder um, started playing around a bit with Strong Room as a bit of mm. a, another uni project, if you like. So, um, no, that experience was great. I was in a team of other people that had actually had some work experience at that time. So I got to learn a lot about, you know, what the development process, process looks like, um, you know, how to effectively engage in a team and, um, you know, divide up work, if you like. So, mm. um, yeah, it was actually a fantastic experience and I think something that Swinburne excels in, which is, um, you know, practical learning. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that where you met your co-founder, Max, or you had already met him beforehand? No, no, Max and my, so Max, uh, my co-founder and CTO at Strong Room, um, we're longtime family friends. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so actually when we were younger, we used to share Christmases together um and there's some embarrassing baby photos of us floating around there somewhere but um uh no he actually went to melbourne university and then you know when we both started uni we caught up and shared experiences and um started giving strong room a crack i love it i love it i feel like it almost also it it, it was a good timing and also a good project where 
you and Max can test drive to work together to see, despite that during up, can you guys really lock yourself in the room and working together on project where there will be and there will be debating, there will be excitement, all of those things that help you to stick together for the last six years in building the strong room. Would you say that was the ex that 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 is the way of like how that bond is becoming stronger, but equally allowing both of you to to get to know each other better. Yeah, hundred percent. That's right. So, I mean, I think interestingly, um, Strongroom has quite close ties to Swinburne. Um, yeah. As part of our early company journey, we were actually part of the Swinburne Accelerator. Mm. Um, so that was where we. Um, got some investment from Strongroom um, as a bit of a grant. Uh, we got to use their facilities and some of the offices there to start on our initial journey. Um, but even before that, we'd actually incorporated our company in Strongroom um, in the basement of the Swinburne Library, in fact. Yeah. So that's that's where we signed Strongroom to start off. And um, yeah, I think, you know, working together from such a young age um we've obviously had to go through a lot of experiences together but um yeah it's all been part of the learning journey i know i see that you were looking up to record the day can you still remember the days that uh one of those days you guys were locking yourself at the lab uh incorporating whether it was the incorporating the company or maybe writing the code to build strong room was that one day that you it, that came to your your mind when you were recalling that just a moment ago? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. When we incorporated the company, it was in a bit of a dilapidated um, old room at the basement. Um, <laughs> it didn't smell great. I think that's where they sent all of the broken furniture. Um, you know, that's where students stay overnight and get their work done before it's due. At, nine o'clock the next day. So um, <laughs> quite vivid memories of that, but you know, they've since um, refurbished and it's a, it's a somewhat acceptable space now. So can't go back and visit that place. <laughs> it must bring a bit of memory now for the student who are listening to these, what would, you, what would be your advice to this sort of a capstone program or even maybe not capstone program, but any project that they thought it would be worthwhile undertaking that may or may not lead to, to a, a commercial success. What is your advice to these students? Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, definitely take that work seriously and do your best because many times the work in those capstone projects has actually led to, you know, directly to different businesses. Um, it mm -hmm. wasn't in our case, but, you know, at least it was fantastic experience and, you know, the people you meet along the way there as well in those different courses can be great li lifelong friends. Um, they might join you in business later if that's something you want to go into, but, um, yeah, I guess do your best and um, make the most out of it because it's a pretty exciting experience. <laughs> uh, speak strong room how did that name come about is that from the the lab way <laughs> actually incorporating <laughs> the company <laughs> oh what is the uh, meaning of this the name behind the, the the company name yeah um no it wasn't it would have been pretty funny if it was from that place <laughs> but um no the name strong room comes from the idea that um people want to store their medical information in somewhere that's safe secure um impenetrable if you like and so we named it after the room in a bank a vault generally in the basement where the most secure items and valuables are stored um, and so we want to be that place where people feel comfortable to store and manage their medical information i love it i love it now tell us a little bit more about your current role uh, as the cto at strong room yeah um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders, um, and we started Strong Room nearly six years ago now. Um, 
And the primary vision of Strong Room is to reduce adverse drug events. Um, and adverse drug events, uh, as a bit of background, are a, a huge problem, but they're essentially any kind of issue with a medication. It might be that a patient took it at the wrong time or the wrong amounts, um, and that led to some kind of negative outcome. So uh, globally, adverse drug events lead to about 20% of hospital admissions and readmissions. And in Australia, they cost the, the healthcare system about 1.6 billion a year. Um, and globally over a trillion dollar trillion dollars in associated costs so um, so it's a huge problem but actually strong room was started on a bit of a different pivot where both max and i had visited a hospital recently um, and we would had to fill out endless paper forms uh, before being admitted and we thought there had to be a better way to have that medical information come with us uh, wherever we went so our initial idea was actually to use facial recognition um, to pair patients with their medical records um, mm. and have that be a way that it could follow you around. Um, and we thought it would be particularly interesting um, for non-communicative patients, say those that were unconscious or couldn't communicate or write down their medical records, um, that you would simply be able to use their face to pull up those details in a time of need. Wow, that that is yeah. fascinating in so many ways. I think um, the number one thing that pop up that is fascinating is that using the facial recognition in the healthcare, which is a uh, industry or a sector or area where data is so sensitive, uh, privacy are so important. How did you guys convince the such a uh, uh, conservative sector to open up to the idea of using facial recognition when it, it when in, in such an early years in, in such an early day like six years ago when the reality is the facial recognition is only just getting started these days is my is my opinion yeah no you're right and it's a great question um it wasn't without its challenges but mm. at the same time there were a few parts of it which made it definitely easier to get across the line. I think one part of facial recognition, which is a bit of a misconception as well, is that you know you have to have an image stored of that patient. But really the way it works is you just take a photo of someone's face um, and then with the system we use, um, you just collect one kilobyte of data, which is a, a biometric identifier, if you like, you know, how your mm -hmm. eyes kind of spaced. Um, Where's your nose in relation to the rest of your face? Mm. Um, and you can't reconstruct someone's image from that data. So there's not actually necessarily an image stored of that patient. Um, you just need to save this identifier and then use that to compare every time you take their photo. So in terms of privacy concerns, that definitely, um, definitely eased things. But I'd say also at the same time, it was communicating with the patients about why this is being used, what the benefits of it are, um, and working with the clinicians to do that communication definitely, um, definitely helped. So to have the data um, to be filled up automatically after doing the facial recognition, does that mean you would have to convince them to fill up their personal uh, and then associate it with your face to some extent so that so if they go into the hospital unconscious then when you do the facial recognition to fill up the phone then all of those steps would only be possible so it feel almost to me that it was another big challenge that you had to overcome because you are not asking the the patient or the clinician to do the facial recognition while in in, in the time where it is so much needed, but in the time where they, they probably think that, well, would they would that day come? And of course they would probably, most of the people, including myself, would hope that that day never come. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Again, another great question. Um, we realized this problem quite early on as well. Um, so, and actually it comes down to the fact that 
when we developed this initial system out, the infrastructure wasn't in place in the industry to support it. Um, to our kind of amazement, we realized that still a lot of the processes within these institutions were still paper-based. So in fact, yeah. there just weren't the systems to implement and link up their medical records to existing systems. Um, so, you know, at that point, quite early on, we realized that as part of our journey, we would have to create a lot of this core basic digitization, if you like, to support mm. these processes. And then later, once those were in place, kind of build these more advanced systems on top of it. Um, on the facial recognition aspect of things, we pivoted slightly to use it more within community pharmacies rather than within, um, say, hospitals, for example, where that problem you mentioned is faced. Um, and in pharmacies, it's a lot more usable because you've got repeat patients coming in um, who they'll see very regularly and you've got that opportunity to collect that data from them. Right. And I am still amazed whenever I, uh, when I've upgraded my iPhone from the, the one with the button where it locked me in with my finger thumb, uh, my, my thumb uh, with the, the print, fingerprint. Uh, to the to the later to the other version where it was locking me in with uh, facial recognition, I was still amazed. I, I remember that, and I recall this was probably less than a couple of years ago. Uh, so, how much te technical expect that the did you and Max have to pick up in building the facial recognition technology back then? where I imagine that the rest of the, like even the, the big giant was still developing at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, facial recognition technology has actually been around for uh, quite a long period of time. Um, I think there's a few advancements which have helped it recently. You know, you've got improvements in cameras where, mm. you know, you can actually have good ones in your phone enough to take a clear photo consistently of your face so that's maybe one thing that's helped it um, become more popular recently um, and you know a lot of the time with facial recognition you've also got a trade-off between speed uh, and accuracy as well so um, you know unlocking your phone you want it to happen quite quickly and therefore there needs to be some improvements that are made um, to those kind of algorithms but um, you know, if you're happy to trade a little bit of speed for more accuracy, um, which in our use cases, particularly back then, we were able to do, um, you know, it can be a lot more effective. Can you still remember the very first pharmacy who signed up to use your technology? How was that day like for you guys? Yeah, um, uh, nerve wracking, I'd say. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think. Uh, we made a concerted effort quite early to actually try and sell our software quite um, quite early on into the market. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of startups um, fall into where they want to really perfect the technology and they'll keep working on it. And by the time they're finished, the industry's moved on to something else. So I think it's quite early for any startup to um, try to sell their product quite early, get it out there, get feedback from the industry. Um, so no, our product wasn't perfect when we first sold it, um, but we got a lot of, you know, invaluable feedback from them. I love it. And I think the whole idea of the strong room where you talk about reduce the adverse drug event, uh, and one of the key, obviously the key selling point of that is to improve the medication safety uh also contribute to the control drug management was that the whole idea that is tied to 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 the pharmacy and eventually also the hospital to ensure that the right amount of the medication are uh, being used uh, as you improve the process of uh linking the 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 patient and the prescription um, with a better way of linking those two, two, two data together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I think that comes to one of the some of the big problems that are facing the healthcare system at the moment, which is that it's quite fragmented. Um, there's a lot of different systems out there, and generally they're not known for talking to each other very well. So that's why when you go into these different institutions, you've had to fill in your medical records again because they're just not being transmitted between these different softwares. Um, this is a problem which is definitely improving and being solved and within other industries um, has been worked on quite a lot as well. Um, but yeah, essentially that comes to our vision of having a more unified healthcare system where, you know, whether it's a patient going from an aged care facility into a hospital um, or from a hospital to their pharmacy to pick up their medications, for example, they should be able to see those records um, and receive the care that they need without having to fill in these details again every time. Right. So how are you going to achieve all of these uh, in, in addition to the facial recognition? Yeah. Um, what we've really, the way we've approached it is much more of a bottom-up approach. So we solve workflow problems um, and issues which we know we can help clinicians with in each of these different verticals. So starting off in community pharmacy, for example, we've really focused quite heavily on the controlled medications issue. Um, so these are drugs such as methadone, um, subutex or suboxone, which patients um, who've got opioid dependency issues need to take every day. Um, or it might be, you know, other controlled medications such as strong painkillers. Um, and we create workflows to help in those areas um, and then link them up with other verticals, such as aged care or hospitals. You mentioned about opio. So is that, and, and I read that opio is quite a big issue in the state um, where I think it is literally uh, killing a lot of lives every year. Um, so does that mean strong room is being utilized in the States as well? Uh, no, we're not in the US at the moment. However, it is also a huge problem here in Australia as well. Um, in a lot of the West, yeah, it's uh, opioids are a, a huge issue um, due to a number of factors. Um, so there are many programs in place in the community to try and support these patients um, through that journey um, and to, you know, ideally eventually get them off these opioids. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're highly addictive. And so for a lot of those patients, it's quite difficult. Um, and that's why there's all this support in place. Right. Given that Australia is such a big country and with uh, lots of uh, population as all equally in the regional, uh, the cost of the healthcare in some of those regional, I imagine, could be quite expensive. And I think, especially because of the pandemic, um, Zoom meeting becoming a lot more normal. I, I feel like I suspect that telehealth, uh, remote patient monitoring is getting a little bit more normal as well, or is becoming more accepted in case that you you find in in what you guys are seeing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, which I think is a great thing, you know, the accessibility of healthcare, the affordability of healthcare. Um, in a lot of ways, it's been a great change for the healthcare system here in Australia globally. Um, but at the same time, we've seen that a lot of the systems that would be needed to support it aren't in place. Um, and that's why particularly digitization is having a huge impact. Um, mm. You know, clinicians can access their systems anytime, anywhere. You know, they might be at home um, and, you know, they might get a call from a patient. Yep, they can log in. They can see those mm. medical records in real time and, you know, have the information they need to provide the patient with the, the care thereafter. In saying that, is that any thing that you guys are doing in tying all those three things together in, I mean, like telehealth, uh, remote patient monitoring with the 
control drugs management and perhaps the facial recognition. I feel like they were sort of like interlinked to each other. What, what are the interesting things that you guys are, or what are the interesting things that you see that is happening in, in that space with the use of the AI, things like the facial recognition? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, telehealth's not something that we're, we're currently in, but we've looked at it before. Um, however, there's a number of companies which are doing fantastic work in that space. And we try as much as we can to integrate our product into, you know, the different systems that are out there. And I think that's a key part that different healthcare providers um, should look at doing to provide, you know, better care to patients, essentially, at the end of the day. Um, in terms of facial recognition, yes, it is It is super interesting for, for that use case. Um, and we can provide, you know, facial recognition facility for other companies as well, um, if that's something that they want to, to have within their software. So, um, you know, that's, that's definitely something we've tried to focus on. I can imagine. So what are the interesting things that you have seen other people, uh, other companies doing? Can you give us some example, especially the, the, the use of the data, analytic and AI that is happening in the industry wide? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think on facial recognition, for example, there's a few companies um, out there which are focusing on detecting different, um, you know, conditions in patients, for example, um, you know, patients that might, you know, I think Down syndrome, for example, is a, an easy one to understand where there might be, you know, facial differences in the patients, but there's a number of other conditions where the same is also true. So we're seeing a lot of companies using facial recognition to kind of identify those different features um, and provide potential early warning signs to clinicians that this is something the patient might be facing and potentially identify it sooner than a highly trained clinician might even do. I think aged care is one of the areas that you guys start working and trying to get into the market. Uh, my understanding is that I have read somewhere that I think one of the things that people uh, some of the company have deployed the, the tech in at the aged care facility is I think to get the uh, the resident wearing the 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 wearable uh, devices on their wrist so that they can monitor and detect <coughs> if the patient uh, fall down or uh, something uh, or get into an accident or something. Where do you see this technology is heading? Hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, we're, we're well aware of a few companies doing that, and I think it's fantastic because a lot of the time in aged care, there can be things that might seem innocuous to those that, that aren't in that environment but could be quite serious in aged care, such as someone falling um, or you know, experiencing other conditions. So, um, I do think digitization in those spaces will have, you know, huge, huge benefits. Um, and that's something we'd love to integrate into our aged care platform as well. Speaking of facial recognition, it's, there's also um, some tools out there that can look at uh, video feeds and identifying patients that might have fallen. Um, so that, again, that's a really interesting use case of that technology. I agree, and I think the big question that prompt to, uh, popped to me to, to think about that is that it almost feels to me that both of them are competing with each other uh, in a way that whether it's the wearable devices that gonna be doing better or uh, whether it's a preferred way by the resident uh, or would that be the camera? I think that seems to be the common pro. Hmm. With your gut feeling, what 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 is it telling you that who's gonna win, or what or what is it, <laughs> or or maybe what is your preferred method between the two? Um, I think you know a bit of both is great, and I think it also depends on what the patients in each facility want as well. Um, I think that's really important. So if people are uncomfortable with the technology that's there, I don't think you're going to see the kind of benefits that you want to see out of it. <clears throat> Um, I think 
wearable devices, for example, can provide real-time information on, um, you know, vital signs, for example, that you can't get from from camera technology. Um, and so I think as well, you can then feed that data directly into digital systems like ours to provide clinicians with all the information they need to provide that better care. I think, um, you know, image recognition still has, uh, it's great, but it can still have a way to go in terms of, you know, potential false positives, um, you know, with people falling, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope they both can provide benefits, yeah. <laughs> I see exactly where you're coming from, especially even though in, I think I, from what I read also that there are already camera out there where it's not necessarily doing the image, but more of the, where, where the camera, it doesn't, I, I don't know what's the best way to describe it because I don't know the, the terminology, but from what I read is that it doesn't necessarily do the normal camera setting that it filmed the entire thing. Instead, it only use almost like the infrared, uh, those sort of thing, and it, it doesn't actually see the who, who exactly that person is. But I could still suspect that if the people are not familiar how that technology will or don't really understand it, they would still have that strong concern about the privacy. It, it's the gut feeling. I guess the big big question that I think is, that I have for you is that for all the experience that you have got, what is the best way to convince uh, the patient to take up to, to adopt the technology despite the fear of the, or the concern about the data, the privacy? I think um, there are roles that media is playing in a way that we often talk about how companies are collecting data for unethical use. Uh, all those concerns are valid, but equally there are people out there just want to do the real work uh, to help the, the society, but could be equally impacted by those negative uh, media press uh, that we read. So how, what is the best way to adopt, to, 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 to these people in adopting this technology? Yeah, great question. I think facial recognition has particularly been the focus of quite negative media coverage uh, in terms of different AI and analytics tools. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in large part that's due to its use in, you know, law enforcement, um, different things to try and control people, but much less so in, say, a healthcare setting where its primary objective is to assist in the identification of patients and their respective conditions, at the end of the day, all things to try and prove their safety and medical outcomes. So I think overcoming that stigma to some people can be challenging. Um, but I think as part of that, it's having, you know, a well thought out change management process. How can we communicate effectively to the patient and the clinician the benefits of the system? And the fact that that data is safe, secure, and not being used for any kind of ulterior motives or purposes. Um, so I think they're kind of the primary ways to to tackle the problem. Um, I also don't think it's just limited to to facial recognition. I think you know AI analytics in general has Excellent. got a lot of these kind of um, stigmas that can come across in the media, but um at the end of the day if it's for a positive outcome and you can communicate that to patients and you safely and securely deal with things i think it can be definitely overcome 100 percent. i feel like we almost talk so much exclusively about the facial recognition i think because of uh, how we started the, the interview but on that note can you share a case study that is other than the the facial recognition but the implementation of data and AI have made a significant impact in improving the medication safety or perhaps streamlining the, the, the drug management process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of our core focuses at the moment is on leveraging the plethora of data, which is in community pharmacy 
to provide different insights to clinicians around who their different patients are um, mm-hmm. and you know how adherent those patients are to their to their different treatment programs and where they can provide the best care to those that need it most. One of our core principles there is uh, value-based care, which is essentially around providing care with the time that you have to those that need it most within the community. Um, and that's that's really what we're trying to address with um, these kind of tools in the community pharmacy space. Um, so some examples of that with implementing this technology in pharmacies is that we've helped them identify their different cohorts of patients and significantly improve the adherence of those patients to what the doctors have prescribed. Um, in doing so, you know, the pharmacy is seeing more of those patients come into their stores. So they're seeing an improvement in their bottom line by potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. But at the same time, you're also seeing a huge improvement in that patient's medication. And so it's really a win-win to everyone involved. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite exciting at the moment. I love it. I love it. In your opinion, what are the main barriers that healthcare organization often face when they are trying to adopt AI or advanced analytics uh, in their organization? Yeah, I think a couple main points. Um, Firstly, I'd say, you know, actually understanding how to use the technology and what its limitations might be. Um, you know, I think misunderstanding of that can lead to false impressions around what the system is doing. Um, and as a result, having, you know, careful consultation with each customer before going live um, about what their goals are and, you know, what they're trying to achieve and how we can assist them is, is quite important. Um, I think the second part as well is, um, again, a bit more of a stigma around, you know, oh, the technology can't do better than I can as a trained healthcare professional. So, you know, why is it coming in and what's it trying to do? Is it trying to take my job, et cetera? Um, and, you know, that's something we've really tried to address. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, we see it as a decision support tool. So it's simply about us providing the clinician with the information they need to provide, you know, the most effective care to the patient. Yeah, 100%. I think um, it seems to be the biggest concern that everyone has is that is the AI is going to replace our job? I, I, I really think that it is not, but it's more about taking the human plus the AI or human plus the machine approach um, uh, in a way that to, to tackle the, the, the problem. Equally, I think it will create a bunch of new jobs as well. It's, it's more about <laughs> efficiency. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give to healthcare organization uh, looking to incorporate AI and technology in, in their organization? Um, I think, yeah, firstly, have an open mind about it. Have an open mind about, you know, where improvements could be made in your organization um, and how it might impact patients and improve their lives as well. Um, I think, secondly, it's really important for organizations to do change management early across the organization, get everyone on board with the way everything's going. and what the potential benefits might be. Uh, I think thirdly as well is, you know, continue their use of these systems, um, post them just being implemented, you know, AI and machine learning systems improve as over time as they're used and they're kind of tailored towards their facility and their patients' needs. So um, stick in there for a bit and, um, you know, you'll, you'll reap the benefits of it. I love it. I love it. That while I got you here in the podcast uh, um, and the listening, uh, the listener are listening from around the world, can I give you a plot about what you guys are about yourself or maybe strong 
anything that you want to share and shout out? Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know. I think it's an incredibly exciting time to be working in the healthcare industry, um, particularly in the AI and machine learning side. Uh, it really is the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the benefits can be to the industry. Um, and we're just beginning our work here. So super excited to continue working with our team at bringing this technology to aged care, to hospitals, um, and also hopefully direct to consumers in the future as well. Um, I guess as well, we're hiring. So if it sounds cool and interesting to you, please reach out. And, um, you know, we're always looking for, for fantastic people to join the team. What sort of roles you are particularly looking for or the type of the people you are looking for? Um, technical development team members, uh, you know, always appreciated um, and will always be considered. Um, uh, at the same time as well, we've got roles in uh, customer support and transitioning to using these systems um, and also sales of these different tools as well and kind of engaging with the industry to, to tell them what, what it's all about. Is it for Australia, in Australia only, or you guys have branches or offices outside of Australia as well? Or perhaps remote work in case <laughs> some talented uh, professional outside of the country is could be a good match? Yeah, we're really open to remote work here at Strongroom, so um, absolutely from anywhere. At the moment, we're just based in Australia, but I would say just uh, watch this space because will hopefully be going um, international soon and super excited about that. Well, I look forward to hear that news about going uh, international. Now, to, start to, to conclude this interview, I have two questions for you that I often ask every single one of my guests. The very first one for you is, what is your most important first principle? Mm. For me, it's uh, empathy and understanding. I think without those two things, particularly in healthcare, um, it can be very difficult to to understand why people are acting the way they're acting. On the one hand, it might be you know empathy towards the clinician who's incredibly time starved, overworked, um, and doesn't have the tools they need. Um, whereas on the other hand, it might also be having an a deep understanding of you know what the patient's journey is like and maybe what they're suffering from and how we can help them move forward with that. Love it. My final question is, what is one film or TV show or book that you have uh, seen and thought it would have been better for your uh, younger self to have? <laughs> um, I'm very much into sci-fi myself. Um, uh -huh. So I recently read the foundation books um, and I also watched the TV show for that but um, I love it because I think it shows the potential extent of human ingenuity um, you know where we might go in the future and not everything's great in those TV shows and, and books but um, you know I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to take away. Love it, love it. I think that helped us to visualize the future. That I remember when I was really little, uh, I read somewhere in a book that uh, it was a philosophical question that does the TV show that we watch reflect on our reality or do our reality reflect on the TV show that we are watching? Or it could be a, 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 a cycle in a way that it does influence each other where the reality is our 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 reality is actually borrow, borrowing some of those uh, uh concept from the the tv show or film or book at, at the same time it goes the other way around as well <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's both i think that you know a lot of the time you know tv shows movies books etc can give us a vision for where we want to go and you know we look back at you know a book that was released 50 years ago and we still think oh we're going to go towards this place now but um you know at the same time obviously they reflect on um what our society is like exactly well thank you so much um for coming onto the show and share what is happening 
uh, about AI in the controlled drug management. It's the very first time I hear this topic of the adoption of the AI and even the facial uh, recognition in such a unique use cases, but more importantly, what is happening uh, overall in the industry. So thank you, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Jason, appreciate the opportunity. If you enjoy this conversation, hit the subscribe button so we can meet again. If you don't, I'll be stuck in an infinite loop. So pull that part by clicking the subscribe and help me out. You can further support us by leaving us a kind review from wherever you are listening. At the end of the year, I will choose a reviewer to send a special gift to, and it might just be you. I look forward to seeing you here next week for a new adventure. If I can find my way out of this endless loop. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.